Welcome to the Centre for Sexuality, Race and Gender Justice, Amina. Thank you very much for coming to be a visitor here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your book project and what you're working on while you're here? Yeah, well, let me begin by thanking you for taking me in in my time of need. Oh, my <laughs> I'm, I'm really appreciative of being given a, a quiet, supportive office space uh, surrounded by truly pleasant colleagues um, and it's uh, it's helping me with the book. Um, I've been stuck on it, um, as in somewhat obsessed but having difficulty marshalling my energies to actually get it written for a number of years. Um, so I'm really glad to be here and you see me in a happy space. Um, so thank you for all that. Um, the book, well, I think part of the reason it's proving so challenging is because it's it's like the book for me. Um, I suppose there's a way in which all books are the book at the time, but this one really reaches very deeply into my life um, and politics, and it is actually about the, the synergy we live um, when we inhabit multiple locations with a degree of simultaneity. Um, and those locations are both geographic. Um, I have some roots here in Kent, as you as you know, and not everybody may know this, but I actually went to a number of institutions here in my early teenage education. I went to boarding schools in Kent um, and had a grandmother who lived here. So I have a, an ancestry here, and maybe that's helping me settle um, but the bulk of and um, the entirety of the book is actually about my my um, life as a feminist who sort of serendipitously found herself being an academic really quite late on. I mean, my first full time job in a university was when I was forty. Um, I'd already been doing research and writing, so I've become more comfortable with academic life but never comfortable with it, if you see what I'm saying. Well, when I say I became more comfortable with it, it means that I have found a way of navigating it. And that navigation is really not being defined by it and not incarcerated, either within disciplines or within particular institutions or particular departments. So, um, and that is to do with a, a deep problem, I think, that most of us have with structures, with existing institutions. Um, so, so this book is about, lately it's about that struggle, but before that it was about the struggle of growing up in Nigeria but coming here quite often for school and then back. So the movements from the age of nine between home and places of study and then places of work um, is, has been quite defining. Um, and then within that, um, uh, you know, the Nigeria of a, as a neo-colonial military dictatorship on the one hand, and Britain um, emerging um, into a, a different era as it lost those colonies. It became a land of, for me, a land of immigrants, a land of racism, a land... So Nigeria, just to clarify, is where you were born That's my home. Up, right? That's yeah. my primary home. It's where I grew up. It's where my family always lived and my extended family lived. I have a few relatives here, but really I, I grew up knowing myself as Nigerian before I encountered race. And I'm eternally grateful for having grown up on the African continent and therefore having another place. Mm -hmm. I think that changes the way we are vulnerable to race. Um, I always say we have another country. So whatever the problems with that country, it is nonetheless another place. So racism can never define us. Um, part of the challenge of the diaspora, I think, is to retain that knowledge um, that we come from a bigger world, um, so you can't be confined to whatever others would say about us or however others would box us in and define us in ways that are very oppressive and damaging. Yeah. So, so the book is, is actually is really about a personal reconciliation across places um, and for me, that reconciliation has always been a political project. It's always been, from very early on, a feminist project. Um, both sides of, um, of 
of my experience, my dual experiences, both. It's something that held everything together because women are actually oppressed um, on the basis of their their bodies, their appearance, their gender identities, oppressed by all the prevailing structures, institutional structures. So no matter how elite or how educated you become, part of that education is a schooling in what it means to be a woman, whether you're a thinker or a worker. The, the meaning of femininity is one that I've always experienced as constricting. Um, you were, I was never going to be the right kind of woman. I was never going to be the good girl. And yet, you know, as a child, everyone wants to be thought of as a good, uh, as someone who fits, and life has been about learning that one will not fit. Um, and then beginning to relish that, I want to suggest, even savor it. Um, finding the joy in it, the mischief in it. Um, so, you know, several different schools, no further comment required. It was never easy to to fit. It was not, I didn't find peace in attempts to fit. Um, I found peace in um, my, my, my ill-fitting, if you like, because it, it's fascinating. Um, how on earth do they think like that was always my question. How could they possibly think that I'm that was another question. What is wrong with them? Mm -hmm. So I think this thing about duality, it gave me a resource of to, which I was able to turn back. Um, that's probably some quite vague. Uh, so perhaps tell us about who them is in some of those specific contexts, perhaps before you became an academic and what mm -hmm. led you to the book, as it were, mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, something about that trajectory. Mm -hmm. well, as I said, it, it centred very much around not fitting with being a woman, a, a girl, a woman, in the right kind of ways, and that's all the way back. I was a tomboy, I climbed trees, I liked playing soccer. So, you know, we, we all have these stories. Um, uh, in Nigeria, it manifests du in a dual way. Most people uh, are poor, so you grow up seeing poverty. Mm. Um, uh, you grow up, I grew up seeing civil war um, and witnessing um, militarized violence, um, experiences that are very one in the West, the word would be trauma, but they, they are also formative. Um, they would explain why I'm very much against military, militarization and military rule, why my most recent Facebook post is how angry I am about the fact that since the US Africa High Command, um, was since it was established and has moved more and more onto the continent, there's been a rise of violence on the continent, um, which I read just two days ago. Um, so, so there are things that early on in life that shape you. Um, but that got me interested in, naturally, in what, how we organise to resist it. So some of my early research projects before I was an academic were looking at the effects of military dictatorship and the ways they play gender politics in Nigeria. Um, that, those were the first research projects I did on, on the African continent. The first projects I did here, inevitably, and I think this is very much a Western uh, luxury or obsession, were, were on identity. I looked at how we resist being racialized subjects, how we, how black women, despite sexism and racism, um, can actually be extremely creative and find the resources to develop healthy, forward-looking identities. So that's the psychology bit. Um, and that, that actually, you know, you're just thinking in a normal, everyday sort of way. But um, later then, it, what you learn in the academy is that that's actually a radical idea because the presumption is that most black people are mentally disturbed or mixed race people suffer from, back then, it was identity conflict. No one had understood that most of the people in the world have multiple subjectivities and are multiply located. And of course, I'm talking about the 70s and 80s when people still believed in the singularity of a nation and a national identity. And of course, this singularity manifests in military dictatorships. Um, it manifests in, in theocracies. It manifests um, uh, in ethnic conflict. It's the assumption that this is the true nation and everything else is other. Well, I take a leaf from Virginia Woolf. Woman is always other. So in whatever national context, we have our own project as well, which is to critique the nation, to critique, critique um, 
the dominance of masculine power and its destructiveness and, and to survive that and, and push back against it in um, the most creative and imaginative ways we can. Um, so, you know, that, that takes me to the sort of cultural theory I work with, which draws very much on Cabral, Alan Cabral, this idea that our cultures can constitute a reservoir of resistance. Um, and he was talking really about rural um, farm people um, in Guinea-Bissau, but the same applies to black women. As a, as a feminist from Africa, I read Cabral to say women have, because we've been marginalized and oppressed, um, our creative reservoirs haven't been fully absorbed into globalization. So, you know, that takes you to an argument about colonialism. Actually, it was men who joined the army, conscripted or recruited. It was men who staffed the colonial bureaucracy. It was African men that women like Mrs. Ransom Kuti rose up against in the 1930s. So women's anti-colonial struggles first target was African men because they were the agents of colonialism. So you can see where I'm going with this. Feminism has an enormous um, visionary political agenda that undoes the complicities that uh, African nations in particular are still very, very much involved in. And those are the complicities with dominant regimes of power, with um, capitalist extractive economics um, that are, you know, so, so the dynamics are, have a long history, but they're still very present today. Coming back to my book, my book is actually about what makes some women feminists in African contexts. So I, that's what it's primarily about. So to do that, I look at how, how we grew up feminists. I've done a lot of interviews, probably close to 100, with other women who identify themselves as feminists around the continent, most li all living on the continent. Um, and then I've looked at the work they do, and that means both the organizing work, of setting up organizations, um, creating movements, uh, interacting with one another, and in all of that work, going beyond themselves. So when I say they're making movements, a feminist thinker works with movements, in which not everybody's going to say they're a feminist. It might not be safe to do so. Mm -hmm. They don't have to, it doesn't matter. The point is that a movement is bigger than the people who make it. So I'm looking at the intellectual and political work that feminism, embodied in feminists, has been doing over the last 30 or so years in post-independence Africa. Mm -hmm. So when, so just uh, to clarify then, when you're talking about feminism, because this will be the big talking yeah. point, and of course there's lots of debate about what that means in the current context, you're talking about the resistance that has come out of post-colonial uh, African. African women's movements and resistance mm. within that post-colonial context. Yes, I mean that's certainly what I mean by African feminism, right. contemporary African feminism. Um, you see, it's a bit like you know the earlier thing I said. You know, psychology defined us as 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 wrong, as pathological. Well, the world says Africans cannot be feminists. That's a ridiculous idea. <laughs> I mean, it's. Um, you can trace any number of genealogies. You know, you can do ancient civilizations if that's what you like, and say the first university on the planet was established by a woman, a Tunisian philanthropist in the ninth century, created Al Karawin University. Mm -hmm. It's still there in yeah, the city of Fez. It. You've been, I've yeah. been, I took pictures. Yeah. I mean, what an exciting notion. Yeah. This was long before the German all male monastic uh, cave like institutions. Um, that's if you want to do the ancient civilizational discourse, which is a good one, I like it. Uh, you can talk about the pharaohs and the great queens. Personally, I'm a bit too left to really relish feudal military queens. I'm named after one, uh, I think 13th century, Queen Amina of Zaza was, uh, you know, I admired her. We all grew up in popular consciousness. People like her uh, feature very strongly. But, you know, we do have to critique. Um, feudalistic societies, militaristic societies, much as we might enjoy those myths. So I'm much more involved in the present in terms of what I want to, to share and what I want us to think through about feminism in Africa. Um, feminism is un-African, is what most Africans will tell you. It came from the West. Mm -hmm. Well, that just says we don't know our own history. Mm -hmm. I would argue the reverse. They got it from us. You know, women in Europe didn't have the vote. 
-hmm. in earlier centuries. They were corseted and cloistered and the poor ones were sent to work in mines with their children. These were not feminists. Most women here are still not feminists. Mm -hmm. I think they got the idea when they went to Africa and saw women farming, building houses. They got to West Africa, they encountered women who were major traders. Mm. Um, I think that made them realize that this is not God ordained or everywhere, it's not universal. But over there, there are women doing very different things. So, women can be many things. So, I think that that destabilized the assumption, the European assumption, that women were intellectually inferior backed up by their science, that women were the weaker sex, again, backed up by their Bible and their science. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Africans, I don't think, I'm not saying that Africans don't need feminism, we do, because there are plenty of things about African cultures that are oppressive to women. But you can't tell me that we learned feminism from the West. Mm -hmm. They were very, very inspired. Western women were thoroughly overexcited by the fact that women fought for liberation mm -hmm. on our continent at a time when they never went to war. They were at best camp followers, servicing and following the troops. Um, so, you know, I, I tell that, tell, tell someone from Africa that uh, Western women are stronger, more able, more productive than your average African woman peasant. And you see, you see where I'm going with this. Absolutely. It's nonsense. So it's a so fiction. There's everything, there's everything good or developed is almost. supposed to come from the West. Well, yeah. I think that's nonsense. I'm not, mm -hmm. not an idealist. I'm not going to romanticize Africa because my primary business is challenging the subordination and oppression of women on that continent. And it has been bad. It still is bad. But don't tell me that the idea of liberation came to us from the West. Mm -hmm. Certain uh, liberal tenets, such as um, women's right to vote, um, maybe, because you know I don't know what political systems we had, they were destroyed. Now, African independent nations mostly afforded women the vote from day one. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the earliest examples of our, people who used the word feminism, oh, so it's a French word originally from invented by a man in the 18th century in French, feminism, I presume. Um, but women who call themselves feminists on Africa, you know the examples we go back to Egypt in the 1930s where they had an Egyptian feminist union. These examples, this is the history that is not being taught in schools. So part of the book is, I'm not going to do all that, but out of it is growing an, an ever deeper awareness of the need to archive um, and to rewrite the history and to recover. And that for me is, um, we had it as a nationalist project. You have the UNESCO nine volumes on the history of Africa, which say nothing about women. Mm -hmm. They left out half or more of the reality that Africans as people have lived. Mm -hmm. So we need a people's history. We need a, a woman's history. We've got to do a lot of correctives because the paradigm of history that we did inherit from the West was entirely androcentric. Mm -hmm. It's the story of men and wars. To decolonize history, we had to attend to peasants, to creoles, to, to the oral narratives of people, because the colonial archive excluded Africans, and it certainly excluded African women. There are very little, very few traces of our existence in those archives. Mm -hmm. So as African people, we know we have to redo the archive. Mm -hmm. We have to form our own archives. So my book is just a very little project, which is um, looking at what it means to write our own histories, um, not as individuals, it's a very collaborative project. I, I don't like to think of it as my project, I'm writing it, but I couldn't do so without the collaboration of um, all the women who are in the book with me, mm -hmm. um, who have hosted me, sat with me, talked with me, we've conversed, we've gone almost like consciousness raising in the same space. Um, explored what made us feminists and, and done our life stories and then um, the networks that I've accumulated over my years as a writer and of course as a, an editor of a journal Feminist Africa That's these, all the work I've been doing over the years has given me the network that is writing this book um, with me Wonderful and so does it start at a particular moment in time um, and are you thinking about it as an ongoing archive that can be... Yeah, it's like the, you know, one of those uh, Pandora's box books yeah. that's just a, I'm th thoroughly overstimulated the whole time. <laughs> so that's why I'm trying to break it down and say, I'm going to do a small book out of which 
will grow many projects. So, mm-hmm. the, um, for example, I mean, this is an example of, I would say, feminist research practice. Um, everyone I interview, I record, I transcribe in full, and then I correct and send them the transcripts and say, now write your memoir. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to cultivate lots of other writings as part of my methodology, and one of the projects I want to pursue after it is to get some funding, maybe take us all off to a retreat somewhere, sit with those transcripts and initiate at least a dozen other books, mm-hmm. um, because there's way too much for any individual to write. So it's a book about movements, but I also want the movement to, to, in, to take on the responsibility of writing at a time when even the little archives that we had are threatened. Mm-hmm. Some of the organizations I visited had had archives 10, 20 years ago. One of the saddest was they had a whole library and documentation center. They shut it down because they needed to rent the room out to earn money to pay the rent because the climate and the funders' interests have, have changed. <laughs> so archiving and a resource and information center is no longer seen as urgent. You know, we're supposed to be doing survivalism, as an American feminist I know called it survivalism and bearing children. No, we actually need our intellectuals. Mm-hmm. We need to do this work. Um, and that's why some of us work in and around universities as well as in civil societies. Mm-hmm. Someone asked me once, how do you stand it? You know, why are you still in the university? This was when I was on the continent looking at the University of Cape Town. And I thought, and at that time, I think the number of undergraduates enrolled was six million. So I said six million young Africans, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't have a choice. Uh, we have this thing they're calling the youth bulge, and everyone is viewing it as ho- with horror as an enormous threat. Mm. Um, I think we need to turn our heads in the opposite direction and see this as an incredible, vibrant resource that we must be working with all the time. Can you tell us, as you talked about the academy in particular, can you tell us a bit about uh, your work at the University of Cape Town and your involvement with gender studies there? Well, you know, I I have to say I should be very grateful to the University of Cape Town. It got me, forced me to think in lots of ways. Um, I think Cape Town was a huge shock for any West African landing there because it really is so colonial. So in the end of the 20th century, I think I got there, maybe I visited, wouldn't visit during apartheid, I think I first visited in 96 as a guest. When I finally went to stay there in 99, the thing that struck struck me was where are the Africans, you know, the so-called colored labor reserve mm-hmm. and the mentality of most people. They want to tell you about the German ancestry and that their auntie has blue eyes. May Tony Morrison rest in peace. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, she just, yeah. yeah. So, so the coloniality, it was really, um, for someone who at that stage had done psychological work on race, to find myself in that crucible of colonialism long after the part of Africa that I came from had been politically independent and in any case never fully settled in the way that the that South Africa and East Af- parts of East Africa were. I mean, very few white people ever made it up the Niger because they all died of malaria. Um, I was just reading a book on the history of malaria recently, but it really did stop them. So we never had that kind of pervasiveness um, they, the British relied entirely on collaboration with the Fulani, um, the Islamic emirs, mm. to um, govern Nigeria. So those were the tax collectors who paid the British. I mean, my father tells the story of how his particular ethnicity was taken over um, because the Fulani arrived with the British and uh, machine guns. And the rumor is that one blow, 200 horsemen lay dead. In other words, the gun defeated the swordsmen and the bows and arrows and just massacred them. So there was no, they couldn't resist after that. There were no men left. Mm. So, but, but that co- collaboration was how we experienced colonialism. It's a very different thing where most people in the country, in the rural areas, have never seen a European. It's a very, very different mentality and culture mm. that survives that when, in contrast to a place like Cape Town, where black people, as in African people, were not even allowed to live. Mm -hmm. It was brown people. And then the South Africans have many, many funny ideas and fetishization of of, uh, the Khoisan and claiming that they and the original, uh, a lot of myths. So um, a troubling place, 
The university, however, was committed to, at that moment, to becoming an African university. And what was in the middle of the campus, but for this enormous statue of Cecil Rhodes. Mm -hmm. I used to sit in my classes and say, this man would not be sitting there if it was Nigeria. And now he's gone. So, much as Cape Town was colonial South Africa, as a new nation, was a hugely exciting place to go and work for a few years. So my role was to try and transform. Um, I decided not, I decided to leave the institution to them and go for the curriculum. So to transform the thinking and the teaching content uh, radically rather than to fight about the demography. Mm -hmm. How many black students are we getting? And that's still not enough, incidentally. How many years later, from what I hear? Um, but there are more than there were. And it doesn't matter. In a sense, that's only one layer. What color are the bodies on the campus? The real issue is what kind of knowledge is being taught and produced in these institutions. So I sort of locate myself there. And what are we thinking and how do we change ideas? How do we decolonize minds has, has always been my sort of core business. Um, and how did that um, intersect with gender? Well, they gave me an institute to head. Um, it was called the African Gender Institute. Um, it was a completely, it was not going to be very long lived. Um, and it happened at a particular moment when um, there was a, a very upwardly mobile black South African called Mampela Rampele, very well known now. Um, but she ran an equality project just as apartheid was being brought down, or let me just say, just as before Mandela walked out of prison. Um, so she then became the vice chancellor and developed in conjunction with a actually a pan African body called the Forum for Women Education, African Women Education, this far away. Together they sat and said, We need an African centered an African centre to do gender work all over the continent, and she offered to host it at Cape Town. So she had a dual agenda. She felt that reconnecting South Africa, just as it was coming out of apartheid, to the rest of the continent, which of course it had been severed from and isolated from by the boycotts as much as anything else, would be a good way to deracialize. Mm -hmm. So she had that kind of black consciousness that saw Pan-Africanism as a resource for deracializing, which is, is was quite very visionary um, for the moment in South Africa, um, but she she moved after a year, so a very it ended up being a very small unit with just two other faculty. Um, I was the chair in gender studies for almost ten years. They never appointed another one, but they have an enormous gender studies undergraduate degree. We set up a master's degree, we set up a doctoral. We were just trying to make space in this institution for black people and black women in particular. A lot of our students were men because the South African constitution put gender equality on the agenda um, and did away with homophobia, which meant that we focused our teaching not on teaching women in development policy, but on issues of culture and sexual politics sexualities as well as policy and politics. So we were trying, very transdisciplinary approach. Um, sexuality is of course also political and economic. Mm -hmm. Look at sex trafficking. Uh, you know, so, so a mixture of cultural studies, political economy and history all combined in an approach that would allow us to reinvestigate the everydays and undo um, the legacies, very strong legacies of ex quite extreme misogyny, whether you're talking about Afrikaners or Zulus, I mean, mm -hmm. you've seen what's gone down with the former President Zuma. Um, yeah. All of these things are huge, huge, horrific lessons mm -hmm. in the meaning of misogyny in a post-colonial society riven with racial stratification, with ethnic polarities and with uh, awful levels of uh, violence, uh, both physical violence against women. They do gather statistics there, so that's why we can say more women are raped and raped to death in South Africa than anywhere else. Mm. Uh, many countries don't have statistics. But there's no doubt that um, the combination of class, race, 
and misogyny has played out in South Africa in a way that has been especially inimical to black women, mm -hmm. black South African women, and what warriors that place has produced. Um, it's, it's quite an incredible and very intense place. Um, I spent 10 years there, but you know, everyone has their limits. Um, yes, absolutely. I found it necessary to move on. There was a lot of xenophobia. Um, as you know, I was there having Somali Nigerian children of my own, raising them, and both Somalis and Nigerians were being killed by black South Africans, and that was escalating. The university seemed about to move forward and then slip back, and it was not a comfortable environment. I can tell you stories um, about that. Uh, but let's just say that the it was a white institution and people were very uncomfortable with the presence of any African. And they really didn't, I think most of them really didn't believe it was possible mm -hmm. for an African to be a professor. Mm -hmm. And to be very honest, I think they gave me the job, not because I was a Nigerian or because I was a feminist, but because I had degrees from the University of London, England. Mm -hmm. And they thought, and I speak English. I can speak English a number of ways, but I think in a way they were fooled into thinking I would be different from how I was mm -hmm. in practice. So you moved from there to um, California, yes, UC Davis, where you still are now. That's right. And I know you've been involved in making some films. Um, was that when you had left the continent, or was that while you were still on the continent? Well, I've always tried to be back and forth, and I have to say that Cali California is a beautiful, everyone knows, it's a beautiful place that everyone wants to go to. But for me, it's, it is also the outer reaches of the West. This is as far west in the West as I will <laughs> ever go. After that, it's east. <laughs> you know, it's the ends of the earth yeah. for, for me as a West African. And it's 27 hours flying time from Cape Town, uh, 20 something hours from West Africa. So it's a bit too far for me. Um, but it is a fascinating place. And if you want to see where late neoliberal, I like late, actually late capitalism, it is late already, he doesn't realise it. You know. um, but where, if you want to see the extreme of where capitalism will go, go to Trump's America. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's a frightening place. Um, I arrived there and, and uh, Obama was elected and I felt slightly better. Uh, but so the political landscape is, is, is not favourable, to put it mildly. Um, there are ways in which it's a little softer if you're raising teenagers, as I was by this time. A little softer, we live in Berkeley, no one can complain um, directly, but just remember it's next to Oakland. Um, and, and yeah, so I'm very lucky to have a job at the University of California. I did want to, I chose the public university for my um, political reasons. I believe in public, free public education. And there was a time before Reagan when the University of California was the biggest free education system on the planet. Mm -hmm. Now it's gone down very fast in that particular respect, um, but I did want to see what that could mean and had meant. And of course, I think what it has meant is seen in Silicon Valley. It will not happen again. Mm -hmm. Now the new scientists are coming from India because mm -hmm. you know education has reverted to becoming an elite project in the United States. So. But nonetheless, UC Davis, it's an agricultural, it was originally an agricultural school. It has a whole class range of people, enormous numbers from uh, the farms. Um, the largest ethnic group there is not white, but Asian, uh, huge Hispanic presence. There are very few black people there, despite it being close to Oakland. And that is America for you. That is, the, well, say, the United States of America in particular. So, um, it's too far away from Africa for my comfort, uh, but I'm able to do certain things there. Mm -hmm. um, the film projects that you asked about, um, I should re remember now carefully, but they were to do with the fact that um, they each have their own story. Uh, they're quite serendipitous, but I was not able to be writing when I got dislocated. But before I left the continent, the, the film about witchcraft, for example, grew out of an African Gender Institute research project um, in six countries, which was probably the first time you had a research group of all African feminists looking at sexuality and sexual cultures in the different countries. 
Um, so the Witches Project grew out of one of those, um, which was a study of a community of witches located in northern Ghana. And, you know, books and we know the power of visual media. Um, I wasn't, I'm not, you know, I was not able to write much. So I, I at that time, um, recruited a, a film director, uh, Yaba Bedo, a very accomplished film director, into the research team. She's also got very developed research skills. Um, but with the idea that these six little projects were so original and unique that we should make documentaries out of them. Mm -hmm. So the Witches film was born out of that. And I knew about the Witches Village um, up in Tamale, northern Ghana, through Yaba, because she years before had done a BBC radio thing. And so I knew about this community of witches. And I've always been intrigued by it because I come from a place where there's a lot of witchcraft accusation. Um, I have a cousin who fled my fled Nigeria years ago because she was accused of witchcraft after her husband died tragically of a ruptured appendix. So, so witchcraft is a living and pervasive reality. Um, it's so clearly um, at the conjunction of um, of of sexuality, non conform non conforming women are often targets, and if they are poor women. Um, it's, it's also about asset stripping. They are stripped of all their possessions by their community and, and are killed or ostracized. But there's something very unique about Northern Ghana. So, so that film goes into this community. It's very intimately, beautifully shot um, by the filmmakers um, and looks at what makes women witches mm -hmm. in that particular area. So um, that was a very challenging and exciting project. I can talk about at length. But so it came out of a research project. Um, it was fairly dismal. I mean, it looks at dispossession. I understand 21st century witchcraft. It probably came with empire and the church. If you remember, it's Europe where six million witches were burned alive. Um, so I think, and then the first witch woman ever accused of witchcraft in Salem, Massachusetts was Tituba, a black woman. So this association of femininity and darkness has somehow been picked up in the con in Africa um, and, and has various local manifestations. But it's very much associated with, I would say, social stress, underdevelopment, mass impoverishment. Um, and the fact that those areas where it is common, are oft it often follows epidemics, droughts, crises, where there is no answer for the harshness of life. And, People look for answers and women get scapegoated most easily because of the patriarchal nature of the context. Um, but of course, if you're a middle class lawyer who gets accused of witchcraft, they, they can't do the same to you as they can if you're a poor woman. Um, so, so it's very much about class um, and culture. And it's across ethnicities and across religions. So you can be a Muslim witch, Christian, you can still be accused. Mm -hmm. um, and it was shot in local languages with a few subtitles. I mean, there are about five local languages spoken in that community. So it was about that and about the struggle to, um, of the women themselves. So we, we wanted to change it um, in Ghana. And luckily, um, it was picked up by national TV due to an ally who was probably an accused woman herself once. But as I said, middle class women don't get picked up, but it was screened multiple times on national television. So we were never able to follow up and assess the impact of it, but we every now and then I get a snippet sent to me by the association of those working, still working hard to challenge witchcraft accusation. A little news clip about a community fighting back or mm -hmm. the person who made the accusation being thoroughly beaten up instead of the woman, mm -hmm. you know. So maybe it's having some impact. Yeah. Mm. We hope so. And does it feed in, coming back, bringing you back gently to the book, <laughs> does it feed into any of the narratives that you're archiving and capturing for the book? I haven't interviewed any accused women specifically, but I think that all feminists have a theory about witchcraft. So, but generally more what we're concerned about is, um, and I think the majority of women who call themselves feminists in Africa are left. So the primary... African woman in their mind, their abstract subject motivating the movement is the most vulnerable, the poor woman, which is most women. So I think the socialism within feminism makes us pay particular attention to the most vulnerable um, and those who have been rendered vulnerable by material dispossession. 
i.e. poverty, um, which is a product of the international development landscape. It has been since the famines of the 70s. So feminists in Africa have actually been among the first to critique global development paradigms because of what they've done, uh, relegating women to food subsistence production and then marginalizing food production. It's been a disaster for the whole continent. But uh, producing food doesn't produce profit. Africans eat it. it does, it's not exportable. It's not extractable in the way that mining, minerals, diamonds, oil are. So those resources have become our curse. Mm -hmm. um, so so you know, there's a feminist line on vulnerability, which uh, include, would include vulnerability to violence of all kinds, including witchcraft accusation, which is a very specific um, culturally rationalized assault on, on women. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing you talk about there is power, really. It's all about power. <laughs> um, and is that a thread that you bring out, uh, or a concept that you bring out through your narratives? But I guess what I'm also thinking uh, or hearing you say is, something about the complexities of both being within and not being able to escape so a kind of trappedness and yet resistance at the same mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. so that complicates the idea of power really but power is very very complicated and what you see isn't all that it is it is often its opposite at the same time mm -hmm. so you know power oppresses pushback is resistance that's a pushback against power it's a power the power to resist so they're both, both oppression and resistance are fundamentally about power um, and systems of power. Um, the book is actually, it's, when I say it's a very small book, it's, it's not looking at the masses of women or ordinary women. I'm focusing on the analytic power and the intellectual and political power that a feminist epistemology lends to thinking about the liberation of Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, I'm working with definitely with a theory a theory of power, but one that that reclaims um, intellect. I don't know if you know, but back in the 1980s, the World Bank decreed that Africa didn't need and couldn't afford universities. Africa's intellectuals right. have been pushed out of power. Mm -hmm. I think because of what we see. Nowhere on the continent are scholars as respected as they might have been. Um, if we had pursued the visions of uh, early, if you look at all our early radical leaders, they were all intellectuals, from Nkrumah, Cabral, across the board. And, and feminists are always intellectuals because to be a feminist, you have a critique of the status quo. So I, I work with a broad definition of intellectual, anyone who can think about and reflect on the situation, see it, problematize it, is already an intellectual. But in the case of my book, I don't believe in researching down, you know, you know this nasty stuff about hierarchy, mm -hmm. but I would be very, I'm very interested in training women from different layers and levels of society to write their own stories. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want to presume to write the narratives of other women, meaning other in terms of class and education. Mm -hmm. So when I say my book is a collaborative project, it's actually involving a lot of women with very high levels of education. Um, but who have nonetheless stayed and worked on the continent with a, a dedication that I can only admire mm -hmm. and I feel ashamed about not being with continuously. And my homesickness is also a certain shame um, at being pushed off my own continent by personal circumstances. Um, and um, I'm planning to head back. So I visit as often as I can and I try and stay connected. Mm -hmm. And I think both the film work and the publishing work, mm -hmm. so publishing Feminist Africa, instead of writing my own books, which have been the sort of key, one of the editors, it's a collective project, but for many reasons it's had to have a name, an editor, and a leader. And I've been leading that for 15 years, instead of writing my own stuff largely because of that sense of um, I'm not fulfilling. My, my core commitments. Mm -hmm. So that thing about creating a platform that can unleash the ideas of many, many African feminists on the world is, is much more important than what I, as an individual, might write. So that's what I think. And, um, mm -hmm. Now I've done, done it for so long and it's quite difficult to maintain that kind of work 
and it does have to be more collectivized. So we've just relocated it to Ghana. Mm -hmm. It had an increasingly difficult time surviving at Cape Town, especially after I left now 10 years ago. So it's limped along. Mm -hmm. So we've relocated it to the University of Ghana and it's regrouping and we're about to embark on a, a big uh, opening up and um, rebuilding the community that makes it possible and extending it. So um, that, that's what's on my plate right now while I'm writing my book. <laughs> so we've got a whole new editorial <laughs> structure. Yeah, we've got a whole new set of editors and we plan to multiply those um, going forward. Fantastic. And well, get more co-editors and more issues. And that, that has to grow massively. Um, we, you know, we couldn't shut it down because apart from Africans using it in all the campuses to teach men and women about um, our societies and about gender struggles in particular, um, it's used in gender studies all over the world. It has hundreds of thousands of reasons. We never advertised it. So it felt like a, having a tiger by the tail. So we need an entire community now to make this thing closer, a little inch closer to what it should be. Mm -hmm. It's still very small and very fragile, but it's free and open access. And mm -hmm. I suspect it might have been one of the first because, mm -hmm. you know, we're feminists, we're African, we love technology. It can leap us forward. Yeah. So it was open access from the beginning. We've resisted being bought up and captured, I would say, by corporate publishers. That means it's a very humble project. Um, and we do want to publish not the famous, already peer-reviewed, accredited, published uh, professors. We want to have a blend and make it a space where African women who have not been published can, can look to be published and then move to a peer-reviewed other. It is peer-reviewed, but to other accredited places that... Uh, they may need for their careers and so on. But most of all, it's trying to bridge academics with movements and uh, non-academic thinkers. So it's unique in that. I think it's an activist project. Unique to you, I think it sounds like, because that sounds very much... But I'm not alone. No, obviously, uh, but unique to, to the work <laughs> that you're involved in. Well, it is all about that synergy, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. how you were kind yeah. of talking about the definition of what counts as an intellectual yeah. very broadly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there um, one, well, I was going to say narrative, but perhaps even location, whether that's geographical or otherwise, as you started off with, that really stands out for you in your book, where perhaps your heart lies or that you're finding most difficult or most enjoyable to write about? Well, I think I'd better start by saying that I'm not writing about Nigeria. and I'm not writing about South Africa. Uh, those are the two countries where, on the continent where I have lived the longest. So that's an interesting problematic. It is to do with the intensity, um, uh, the size, the complexity. I mean, these are both huge countries, Nigeria with, uh, some say, 500 languages. Um, but the, oh, I started there, but I can't write it yet. Um, so the, it actually um, starts in Ghana, um, mainly because, well, one, I have spent a lot of time there. I have family and friends there, uh, the university there. I have, you know, there's a, it's a place I've done work over many years, um, bits of work. Um, but mostly it's because there's a community there who would, felt they were able to receive it and they're sufficiently institutionalized. Um, and it's the home of, uh, it's the African home of uh, Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. The locus of African knowledge production was supposed to shift when Nkrumah became president of Ghana in, Dece and in December 1957. There was a meeting to that effect, mm -hmm. attended by all of our great liberation heroes, all men. The anniversary of that was last December, and there was a whole lot of feminists and queer women there too. So things have changed. But that's a good environment. So I start there because, uh, so, so the book is structured like a caravan. And again, it's all experiment. Um, I'm starting it in Ghana, which has its own history of military rule and uh, first ladyism. And the movement reemerges after military rule quite late. We're talking the end of the 80s, the early 90s. And then it goes to, Ghana, to Uganda, which um, many people have heard about in relation to homophobia and there's a way in which homophobia has almost overtaken misogyny in Uganda but Uganda has a, also a very toxic history 
um, from independence in 1962 to Idi, Idi Amin and Milton Obote, Idi Amin product of the East African King's Rifles, British Army product. Um, the, that particularly nasty history, again there, feminism re-emerges in the aftermath of military rule, just as a regime that parades as revolutionary, the National Resistance Army seizes power by, by winning power by, by battle, by war, um, and announces, uh, declares a whole lot of things that are of great interest to women. So a lot of people think this is going to liberate women. The national resistance movement, the no-party system. Multi-parties don't work well for women. You can look at the electoral data. Uh, military dictatorships don't work well for women. In fact, we have yet to have a system that <laughs> works well for women. Um, but in Uganda, the, the no-party system did promote women in lots of ways. It, but there were also feminist organizations who stayed out of it. Lots of feminists went in. Um, some stayed out. So it's a very interesting story about state feminism or the state's African states have always been adept at trying to appropriate um, gender politics and it happens at a conjuncture where the Nairobi conference happens in 1985, mm -hmm. next door, Ugandan feminists are stopped from going to it mm -hmm. and they form independent organisation at that time mm -hmm. um, and then the NRM comes to power and seems to have taken the ahead of civil society and in some ways it did. Civil society is the product of Amin and Obote and, and all everything that's gone on. So it is not friendly to women's, a lot of women's oppression. Um, diverted, I think that, that sort of scapegoating and animosity and the moral policing of women became diverted through the US evangelical church to homophobia and that whole uh, anti-homosexuality bill. So Uganda is interesting in a completely different way and it's at a different historical moment in terms of the global era. And then from there, I go to Zimbabwe, uh, where I have a brother, I've spent time, and I have a, 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 I felt enough contact with feminists in each of these three countries. So Zimbabwe's history, a sketch, you know, the Liberation War, the freedom fighters, um, and what happened to them as the beginnings of Zimbabwe's feminism, post-Rhodesia. So each of them presents a very different post-colonial, in the sense of after colonial rule, and yet still colonial, a very different scenario and in each of these you've had women's movements re-emerge and feminism become part of public discourse in ways that are very very exciting so i want to capture i haven't read this stuff bits and pieces here and there but i think it's time we wrote it because i don't like the way generally i don't like the way other people write about our movements if I may declare ownership. <laughs> We're not allowed to own anything, you know, in Africa, not even our feminism. Well, we certainly look forward to seeing it in the book, which you certainly will be owning. Oh, no. We will be owning. You will be. The collective you <laughs> will be owning. No, <laughs> I'm not a we. <laughs> but so, no, I hope it will be of, of use to lots of other people who absolutely. are activists and thinkers. And I hope you will come back and have a launch for the book here. Be inviting me. Absolutely. I would be delighted. You. <laughs> you know, I have many reasons to revisit Kent. Absolutely. And we'll be hosting you again, I'm sure. So Thank just you. to wrap up then, do you have, and we tend to kind of um, ask this question because of the vibrant postgraduate community that we have here mm -hmm. and the centre being somewhere that wants to foster um, a diversity of, well, as the name suggests, uh, sexuality, race and gender justice. So what would be your top three to five tips for feminists of colour or students generally doing um, work in this field? Mm. Don't expect anyone to pay for it. They never will. Um, feminist Africa, to the extent that it's a free space, is because it has been basically unfunded. Mm. Um, so all the intellectual labour is given by the people who write for it, who peer review it, who edit it. Um, so you need to find a way of taking care of your bread and butter without being captured. Mm -hmm. So that would be the first thing. Um, uh, do not let the opportunity structure of the neoliberal university define what you think and what you write. We understand the need to be strategic, but very quickly pragmatism overtakes you and you can be sunk. 
So freedom is about being able to keep your head above it and out of it and to look in on it critically. So I think that's the thing that uh, always hits me. Um, you know, as well, this is a Zimbabwean expression, because you know, they have no currency there now. Get used to your poverty. Mm. If you want to do things, do not let uh, money or institutional power structures direct you too much. So for that, we need community outside of that is not defined. So network. Um, all the work we've done in Africa has been not through big departments. We've tried to make them by people have tried, <laughs> but actually it's the informal connections that keep us all going. So those informal, quiet networks um, are very, very important. And sometimes the least visible, less visible things are the most important. Um, I like the idea of, of an underground. I think Spivak gave it a very fancy name, the Subaltern. Mm -hmm. Um, but not everything needs to be said, not everything should be said, and a lot of what you have to do, be happy with being less visible. Being over visible is, 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 is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And handle the media very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> and on that wonderful note, thank you so much, Professor Amina Mama, for being part of our network, and we hope to see you back here soon. An absolute treat. Thank you, Soraya. <laughs>